Well, again, hello to everybody who's um, come to this track. Uh, I'm Matthew Johnson, and um, Niles here um, has been one of the people who's been trying to push through various changes to uh, our sub-policy document. Um, it has unfortunately stagnated for quite a long time, so until recently, if you went and had uh, a look at the Java policy, it didn't bear very much relation to what the current practices were. But we've been working to try and bring these two together. So I'm just going to go over uh, a quick summary of um, what changes we've made and what the current state of um, uh, policy for packaging Debian libraries and applications is. And then I want to have uh, a discussion about where we should go from here. Because there's uh, a number of issues I think we should answer in policy to try and improve how Debian package, how Java packages work in Debian. So what ch changes have we made so far? So we are now down to only three VMs in Debian. We have the latest um, non-free Sun JDK and non-free. And we have the latest Open JDK in main. And we also have GCJ. And what are the benefits of the Sun non-free JDK? Uh, so, just historical? Or? So there are, uh, Open JDK is very nearly the same as the Sun JDK. Unfortunately, when they came to release it, there were a number of parts of the system that they didn't actually have the rights to release uh, under an open source license. So those parts they've been trying to implement. So there are a small number of things which are missing, and there are um, a small number of things that don't work quite as well. For example, um, OK, so uh, for example, the, the font management is not working very well with OpenGDK. And uh, the swing interface is slower also. And I've got some bug reports on this. Oh. Uh, so unfortunately, for the moment, we do need to keep the Sun JDK around uh, in non-free. But uh, with luck, as time goes on, Open JDK will begin to approach. Sorry, just a quick comment on that. I mean, I, I would hope we aren't too quick to remove the Sun JDK from non-free, just because there are a lot of business users that are running in. And they're, they're not going to be as quick to migrate to OpenJDK until yeah. they have a level of trust. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, although I don't know how many of those are using the version package in non free. But uh, I, I think it's a big convenience. I, I know folks do it. Sure. So, um, and, and as I mentioned in the previous session, um, there are some problems with OpenJDK in some of our architectures. So, unfortunately, it looks like we're going to uh, keep those. But we have managed to get rid of all of the other um, uh, JVMs we used to have. So, there's, there, there's a lot smaller. Um, range of things we need to make things work with. Um, we've also removed the Java Virtual Machine virtual package. And whilst it used to be the case that a lot of packages would ship uh, dash GCJ packages containing their Java code compiled to native packages, that's now deprecated unless you have a very, very good reason for it, uh, which needs to be discussed in advance. Um, so, meta packages, we now have uh, these uh, default set of packages, default JDK, JRE, and doc. Um, and on most platforms, these are, this is points to open JDK, uh, except on uh, the three which don't support it, where it points to GCJ. And for the m uh, m large part, you, you can either, you will just use open JDK, because your package, unless it does something particularly strange, will work with any of the options. What happened with the headless? Uh, sorry, there are also headless variations of these, so if you have a package which doesn't use GUI, you can depend on it, and with any luck, you'll have a slightly smaller de dependency tree. Uh, we've also removed Java package, because now that we have OpenJDK in main and the latest Sun JDK in non-free, that should be sufficient, um, and we expect one of those is going to work. Um, to repeat it, one question for this, when we don't have Java package anymore to build some custom devs, um, what about security updates for the non-free Sun Java over the course of some Debian stable release? Um, I don't know who's uh, maintainer for that. Yes, we are currently doing stable updates for Lenny whenever a security update is needed. So we currently have 6.20. And the 6.21 uh, 
didn't have any security issue fixed. So, uh, uh, and we've also removed default JDK build depth because um, it was a very confusing name. It's actually only there was only there if you wanted to build a GCJ uh, a GCJ native package. Uh, so we now have I think GCJ native helper instead. And other various changes that we've made. Uh, we now want all libraries to provide JavaDoc. Uh, and this JavaDoc should use dash link and then recommend other, uh, all of the libraries they use so that you get links between all the JavaDoc on the system. Uh, and, if, and if you install with recommends, which is the default, those links will work. And lastly, one of the things which um, was the, the very first part of Java Helper, which I uploaded was Jar Wrapper, which in a lot of cases you have a jar which you can run with java-jar and it will run your application. And if that's the case, then you don't need to ship a wrapper package anymore, a, a wrapper script. You can just set the jar executable, sim link it into slash user bin or whatever. And then if you depend on jar wrapper, it uses bin format misc and it will just execute your um, application directly. Um, did you get in touch with the lithium maintainer to uh, handle such a check? One. I believe okay. it's in the oh, audience. Because yeah. okay. um, it would be nice to have this in Lithium. Uh, I, think, I think I filed a bug relating to that. Uh, there's an open bug. Um, basically, the only work that needs to be done is somebody needs to figure out the right way of recognizing uh, the executable jar files and uh, patch that into the code which complains about unrecognized executables so that it suppresses it for that. And I just haven't had a chance to go look at the magic and figure out what the right thing to do there was. You know, so if somebody wants to come up with a patch, it's, it shouldn't be that hard and happy to apply it. Okay. Um, uh, we probably also need to uh, a link and check the checks. If you do have one of these, it is you are depending on jar wrapper. But I think I mentioned yes. that as part of the. Yeah. Um, so. Now, for uh, I just want to go over what the current state of policy is. So, you know, if you are somebody who's trying to package Java software in Debian, this should tell you what it is you need to do. Um, the policy, by the way, is now up to date on the website with the current state, um, and is in, I believe, the Java Common package as well. So, in general, depending on uh, independent of what sort of Java package it is, um, you must build with a specific JDK. So your setting of um, your alternatives on your system should not affect how the package is built. Um, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I, I'm building a package that has a custom JNI library. Um, where should I be installing that? I'll get onto that on the next okay. slide. Oh, a couple of slides time. Um, and, um, and I mean, this is just an extension of normal Debian policy. Um, everything that you build uh, and install as part of your package must be built by source during the install, uh, build process, so all of the jars class files and Java dots, even where your upstream ships these with the package, you really do have to rebuild them. So, Java programs. Uh, the, the goal here is that if, you're, if a user comes along and wants to install a program, uh, they don't need to know that it's implemented in Java. Um, app get install program name, program name should work. So, the package shouldn't be a dash Java package if it's a program. And they need to have either an executable Java wrapper, um, and now, you know, anywhere in the accepted path is fine. And they must make sure that they deal with any environment variables or um, uh, arguments to the JVM. Users don't know what, shouldn't need to know with a program, with, a, with an application, what a class path is or any of this. So it's up to the, the wrapper script or uh, manifest options in the case of an executable jar to get this right. Um, we have a location for, jar, for any jars which are installed, which depends on whether you expect this to be used from uh, another package or not. There are some, program, some um, programs where part of what they install can be used by other programs. In that case, use a shared Java. But otherwise, they should just live in, um, in the package-specific share directory. What about if I say a Java um, I don't think it needs to be in there. Uh, I think if it's only a... Um, a, a jar which is used as part of the program, it's not used by anybody else, then use a share package as the right location for that. Um, do we have the microphone? Um, well, I think the user uh, yeah, Java package would be useful for libraries that are implemented multiple times, like uh, some stuff is implemented by 
the Apache Software Foundation or by Sun uh, they implemented the same API in different ways. Uh, so it would make sense to have. So I, I don't know if you want to, apparently you're comfortable taking questions as you go as yep. opposed to holding them. No, no, do, okay. do. Is there any guidance for uh, writing these wrappers in particular when you're supporting multiple JVMs and JVM versions? Because, you know, for example, one of the things we tried to do at Sun is reduce the need for command line tuning of the, the VM. But in practice, it, often some command line tuning is fairly helpful. Uh, but now you end up with a, a non-trivial wrapper, and I don't know if you've looked at the way Gentoo handles that, or if there's any other guidance for how to do it. Um, so I believe there are two things currently packaged for helping you with wrapper scripts. One of which, as I mentioned, is jar wrapper, where if you have a static set of options that you need to pass, you can actually put these in the uh, jar manifest file, and jar, jar, jar wrapper will unpack these and use them as arguments to JVM. Uh, there's also, I believe, um, uh, another package for generating wrapper scripts. Um, Java wrapper. Uh, Java wrapper. Yeah. Well, uh, it's for running. Java wrapper is more for building. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know whether that has. Uh, I'm using it for options. a few software, Java software, and it's working pretty fine. Uh, and it's managing such issues. Okay. Great. Um, what about? Uh, I know you have a slide on Java native interface, but uh, with respect to executing, do you allow LD library pass to say? Um, point to so ideally all of the um, JVMs that we ship will know to look in the um, user the JNI directory uh, and have that on their library path already. I don't know if that's the case, but that's something I think we should look to do. And so it will all be there implicitly. If you do need um, an LD library path to run, then your script must set that. So we don't forbid uh, the wrapper to set that? No. Uh, I mean, they, they may well need to, depending on... Um, how they work. Uh, and so lastly, a program must depend on a JVM, and uh, it has to, one of the first option, as with all alternate depends, has to be a real package. If you can run with any of the VMs that we package, then default JRE is the correct one of those to use, as it will install the platform default for your architecture. And then you have, uh, must have an alternate depends on Java X runtime for some version of X, which is the lowest version of the runtime that you'll run with. Mainly that will be determined by what um, class file version you build with. Uh, but if you, there are specific things in newer releases of the runtime uh, that you need, then you need to set a higher version for that. So libraries. Um, currently, uh, policy says that they should be lib some name hyphen Java, although um, renaming that to JVM is entirely possible if we think that's a suitable way to go. Um, and we have, so in, currently in user share Java, you'll find that actual jars are installed as jar name dash version dot jar, and then there's a symlink from jar name dot jar to, uh, to, the, to the version symlink. And the library should build javadoc, and it should link and recommend any dependencies of javadoc that you have. And finally, if you do have any JNI, then this should be in a, uh, the bi separate binary hyphen JNI package. Um, and what I haven't actually got up here, but is in policy, is that the, all of your libraries live in um, user uh, lib JNI um, as lib package name .so. Um, no version uh, With version numbers, uh, if appropriate. Um, and your Java doc should be in a separate doc package because Java doc typically will um, uh, be larger than the rest of your package, um, and installing it just for users who need to run the library um, is a new yes. I mean, I have a JNI that has three functions in it. Now I have to have two packages? Uh, well, you have to have two. Well, so you certainly have to have uh, an architecture-specific package because your uh, JNI sure. will be different on each architecture. If you have um, sufficiently small, and the size here is actually more dependent on the Java size than the... JNI side, um, a small amount of Java in your library it might be acceptable to have a single package which is architecture specific. But if you have a lot of um, architecture independent Java that you're putting in this package, yeah. then that will increase the size on all of the mirrors because all of them have to have it. So the, the recommendation is always to split the packages up. Uh, there were some questions on the verse of Feather about <coughs> uh, saw names and stuff like that. So here we are still using lib name without a number on the name. So we don't want to 
change that more the, than I have, uh, the end of the talk, I'm going to go on to what sort of things okay. we want to change. This is just what the current status of policy is. And in fact, here we go. Um, so that's essentially where we are at the moment. Um, there are a number of things which certainly I would like to change and things which other people would. So transitions. This is one of the things where Java does not have a good story at the moment for handling library transitions either of uh, JNI or uh, ju just of, of, of Java libraries. And a lot of this is not helped by upstream practices where they um, will assume that they can just change whatever they like. And if people, um, when people use their libraries, they'll tend to just take a snapshot of it, bundle it in their jar, and, and forget about it so they don't have any problems with, with upgrades. So the first problem here is that at the moment, in a lot of cases, you need to know about all of your recursive dependencies. So if I have a library that uses another Java library, anybody using me needs to know about that because I need to set it on that class path. Um, and that just means that whenever uh, a library makes a transition that changes one of its dependencies, uh, particularly adding it, then all of the R depends of that library are going to have to change. Uh, they're going to have to make source changes. You can't just rebuild them. Um, and actually, it turns out the JVM has a solution for this already. If your jar contains a class path in its manifest, then, uh, then the, J, uh, the JVM will, when it loads your jar, load everything in your um, manifest class path as well. But very few upstreams actually use this. Um, a possible alternative solution, um, which I think we're going to hear about later, is the um, jigsaw stuff. Um, which may give us a, a better and more robust solution for this. But I definitely think we need this. At the moment, we're in the case that um, you know, C was a long time ago where you know, all of your um, dependencies, everything had to be worked out manually. And I don't think that's a tenable solution going forwards. So second um, point on here. At the moment, we have these jars with version numbers in them and symlinks which don't have version numbers in them. But it's unclear what this is actually useful for. Uh, particularly since they, they tend to be in the same package. So there's no way that you can have two jars with different version numbers uh, installed from the, the relevant two different packages because at least the version of symlink is going to clash. Um, but can we actually change this to make them useful? So the, the analog with, with C uh, is the so name of a package. Um, and you'll have um, an actual file which contains the so name. Um, and then you'll have a symlink which doesn't so that you build against the symlink, but then at runtime, you always run against the, um, the version that you built against. And if you have multiple ones installed during a transition period, you can still do this. Problem, as I mentioned, is that we don't have header files. We don't have any of the things that are normally shipped in a dash dev package. So it might just contain a, a single symlink, uh, which is possibly a little wasteful. Um, and in that, if we were doing something like that, and possibly anyway, should we mandate that you put a dependency, uh, when you depend on a Java library, you depend on at least the version you built against? Uh, as th this means that as long as your upstream is only making backwards compatible changes, then you can be sure that the dependency ensures that uh, the version you built against, which you checked worked, is the one that will be the package will be installed, or a more recent one which also works. Um, so I think I have some other slides on this, but I don't know if anybody has any opinions on any of those issues. It seems like a dev package which has some symbols is kind of excessive if you want to do a multiple versions. I don't think there's any way of avoiding it. Um, yeah. Um, and as, as was mentioned earlier with um, having source uh, jars available, perhaps that's what's in a dev package. You get a symlink and you get source jars. Perhaps at least the documentation. I don't know about the source jars. Uh, well, at the moment we have doc packages for yeah. that. Maybe that should be combined so that you always install the documentation. But then, if you're the dev you're package will need the dev package will need to be installed when you're building auto building the package, yeah. but you don't want the documentation. So it, it seems like the only files you should install in the dev package are those required for compilation, mm -hmm. and that may be just the symlink. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether we want to make a practice of having. Um, hundreds of, of, of packages which only contain a single file. You're all, I mean, the alternative is having something in the regular package that, that conditionally installs the symlink if you're the newest one. Mm -hmm. So maybe a helper, 
like uh, the Eldian ISO configuration stuff that finds the latest version and creates the appropriate symlink. But then you can't then you can't it force an older version of the of the library to be your development version. Mm -hmm. You could use alternatives and set the priority to be equal to the version. Um, it's, it's ugly, but it would maintain the symlink and let you override it. I'd rather have a dev package because then you can you you can say I want this I want to develop against this version of the library. That's how you build it. That's how you build a jar that would, that would build against an older version and also run against newer versions, which you might want to do. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if that addresses the backwards compatibility. <coughs> Sorry, I, I thought about that too. I I, I don't know. It's it's a, it's a tricky thing. Um, I mean, I, I suppose one uh, one I, would it be possible to do what Keith was saying in, in a post inst to just update the sim like the latest version? Would that work? I, I don't think we want that. I, I think explicitly, we almost explicitly want to uh, depend against the oldest version of the system most of the time because that's, if you're trying to build a package that will run against multiple versions of a library and you assume forward compatibility, then you want to compile against the oldest version of the library. Uh, if we're assuming forward compatibility, then I don't think you necessarily want parallel install of things which are forward compatible. Um, I think it's only the point where you, people No, break. you want to compile against the oldest version so that your package will then run against the oldest version. Uh, normally this is used this sort of trick is used with uh, other languages where you're explicitly doing a transition to upgrade to a newer version, and so what you want is for everything gradually as it gets rebuilt to use the newer version, and then you can drop the older version from the archive. Um, and if people are doing essentially backports, then they can they, they, they do that themselves and or I mean, on an older version. Because I mean, my understanding is is that Java works a little is. It, generally isn't going to, if you build against the new version of the jar, you're generally not going to break compatibility with the old version of the jar unless you're explicitly using the new APIs. And it, in other words, it doesn't matter, I don't believe, as much with Java, which version of the jar is installed. Well, except the only way to, t the only way to test that you're not no, breaking testing, compatibility yes. is, to, is to build uh, against with, the older version. Yeah. With, with Java, essentially, you have uh, the API is almost the same as the API. So as long as you're just adding things, then um, you can you can use a newer version of the library as long as the library just adds things and doesn't change anything. But if you use a particular version, there's no guarantee that the thing you're using in that version wasn't added yeah. uh, from a, a previous version, so you can't necessarily use the previous one. Although that, that's basically the problem that uh, for C libraries, um, symbols files solves. Yeah. So if there's something equivalent in Java, then you, you can build the dependencies automatically and it figures out from the fact that you're using that API that you need to depend on that version of the library yeah. and then it then it becomes fairly straightforward. Um, and there's been a suggestion about um, producing sim sim symbols files in, in a similar fashion. I'm interested to the fact that you've actually done this. Uh, uh, a worry when we were talking about this, lot, about this last night is that they might become very large, because typically with Java programs, they aren't very careful about keeping things non-public if, if they're actually you know, private API. And so your symbols files might contain a whole bunch of things which are actually private API. Uh, one more thing also about the, the Java world is that you are assuming that the, the upstream developers knows what is an ABI and an API, and usually it's not the case. They don't worry about the API because usually, uh, in most of the cases, uh, when you are building a huge software with Java uh, libraries, you are including them directly and you are basically freezing the version. So you don't really care about the upgrade of the API uh, in the next release. So it's the Java world is a bit different from the uh, <coughs> software development perspective from the C1. Yeah, the, the, the difficulty is, is that at the point at which you're really completely breaking the ABI, it's not clear that, a sim, that an unversioned symlink is really going to buy you a whole lot one way or the other. Because at that point, I mean, the, the idea of the unversioned symlink is sort of that you can go against whichever the latest version is. But if the ABI is changing completely, you know, at that point you're, it, it just, the unversioned symlink is, is not actually helping yeah. the world. Um, and, and you know, I think it might be beneficial to move to the model where we have um, the ABI, the um, backwards incompatible ABI changes like so names built into uh, as what's the version name. Um, so, and, and drop actually having versions of the package version in, in, in the file name. So I don't see there's actually much use for it. I mean, in, in general, I don't see a whole lot of difference between setting up the symlink in the post install and just including it in the package. I mean, if, if, we, if it needs to be handled separately, I think it's got to be something, something more complicated has got to be done with it. Uh, the question is whether you can have a, um, and at the moment we have things with things like libservlet where you have two, point, you know, what, two versions of the, of, of the package in the archive, um, but 
those can't both install the same um, the same unversioned symlink. Um, oh, so so, 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 so now what they install so that you don't so that you don't always install it. Yeah. If it already exists, then you don't install yeah. it. Uh, uh, so you, they well, don't possibly if it already exists, you replace it. Right. Okay. So if, they don't conflict with each other. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing is, though, is, is that that's semantics, wherein you create the symlink if it doesn't already exist, and if it does exist, you change the symlink if and only if that your version is later than the other version. It's pretty much exactly the sim, exactly the semantics that alternatives gives you. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much people would object to uh, uh, their altern Etsy alternatives being full of uh, jar, jar files. That might be a really interesting uh, mailing list discussion to have cross between the Debian Java list and the Debian policy list. Mm. Um, they, because they, the, the dpackage maintainers all follow the Debian policy list and are likely to weigh in on that kind of a discussion. Uh, just to throw something in at that person I don't like, what about those GI bundles? Oh, sorry? You know, moving everything to those GI bundles. So, um, what, that's um, something which I've been wondering about whether we should use OSGI um, as how we deal with um, versions and transitions and uh, recursive uh, fast path loading and so on. Um, what I'm, I'm actually interested to know is whether Jigsaw is actually a thing we should be moving to because it's built in. Um, to the JVM rather than being. Well, I'll talk about that more later. Uh, but the argument, you know, from from Sun is that, it, well, it, obviously this has been kind of a political thing too. But uh, the argument has been uh, OSGI is outside of lives outside of the Java world. You know, the JVM is not really aware of it, and that that isn't sufficient. That you actually want the compiler and the VM in the class order to be module aware, and that's you know what Jigsaw is doing, is it's bringing that uh, module awareness into the VM uh, to the point that you get rid of the class path. Um, and, and I think that if, if, uh, that's the sort of, sort of direction we should be moving in because it solves a lot of these problems. Well, the reason I don't like OSGI is because people get super sloppy and then they end up shipping 20 versions of the same jar with an application. Sure, but I mean, that's one of the things we can try and fix up. Um, Helper tools are useful for this. Another thing that I uh, like about Jigsaw is, besides solving kind of this uh, version thing, um, there's a performance boost. I mean, that's kind of the big purpose for reducing the number of files that need to be sucked up off the disk. You know, so if you've got something that has uh, that's a little bit more interactive and you hope to have, like for servers, okay, fine, it doesn't matter, but if you've got some sort of command line, something or other that's built in Java, it's the I.O. that kills you. Well, one thing uh, that I think is really what this uh, versioning of jars issue gets to is over time the maintainability of an archive of Java applications and libraries that all, all of which have upstreams that are moving. And how, how do, you know, is there a way that we can not have to tweak each and every R depends every time a, a library changes. I think that's, I, and I don't know if there's a silver bullet for that. Well, one of the things, um, at the moment, it's not possible to do bin NMUs for uh, R4 packages, but actually I think at the point we have helper tools that auto-generate a lot of this stuff at build time for you, um, then actually a bin NM NMU of a R4 package starts to make sense. Um, and I, have, I have actually talked about this to um, FGP Master, um, and they generally seem happy to do the work to, um, or to to allow this to be possible, um, and then hopefully um, I mean, I'm going to talk about packaging tools after lunch in the uh, Java Helper talk. But if we have packaging tools that sort out all of your dependencies, inferring this from well, at the moment it has to be class path information, but it won't, once we've got jigsaw stuff or OSGI or whatever, this can all be worked out for you by the packaging helpers. And then if you do have a transition, hopefully it's just a case of rebuilding. So in that, in that world, you're saying you wouldn't have the symlink, you would have explicit versioning and not try to assume backwards compatibility and versioning? Well, the th what I've been thinking of is that we have the symlink, but perhaps when you um, build the package, it will turn your 
uh, it will um, make all of your jigsaw or class path or whatever dependencies be on the version one, um, which would and that version only changes when you actually get an ABI change. So you end up um, with this um, essentially when if you do uh, and, and then the version would be in your your dependencies as version on the um, package and all this gets built for you by by your packaging helper so if, if a library ch when a library gets upgraded uh, if there's no ABI change it should just work and if there is an ABI change then if a package works with the ABI you can just rebuild it and if it doesn't work with the ABI then you need to make actual source changes but you're going to need to do that anyway if it's broken what you're using the API Somebody on the birds of feather mentioned on the IRC that uh, one of the problems is that Java developers don't care so much about a a API changes. So maybe something else we can do is trying to convince them that they should start yeah. move behaving like the C library counterparts and taking their APIs a little more than just whatever yeah. I put on my public. Yeah, if we can, um, you know, try and get this so that upstreams actually understand where we're coming from and why um, having you know stable ABIs and knowing when they break them is good for, for them and for everybody else who's you trying to use their stuff, then you know that's really good. And I think that would improve matters a lot. I don't know whether the the advent of Jigsaw is likely to try and um, convince people that they need to provide this information um, as upstream or not. I don't want to jump ahead, but I think sure. that's going to be a tough sell. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, the people we talked to at FOSDEM seemed to, um, you know, some of them had, you know, everybody had reasons for what they were doing. But, you know, I think a lot of them uh, were appreciated understanding more what was going on there uh, from our point of view. So that's transitions. I think that's one of the big things that it would be nice to solve. I mean, we're obviously not going to make any changes for squeeze at this point. But if we can get it to a point where we have a good story for how transitions happen, and in the long run, it's going to make all our lives a, a lot easier um, because we aren't going to be doing make work whenever a library changes and we need to make source changes all over the place. Um, so a few other bits and pieces that um, have been mentioned or have occurred to me. First of all is class file versioning, should we require that people build with Java 1.5 class files where possible or, um, or, or whatever the latest one is, um, if, or at least the lowest common denominator of what we have in the archive. Um, and um, do we need to do anything to support multi-arc? I mean, we definitely need to do a few things to support multi-arc. Um, but we should start thinking about those because I believe multi-arc in at least some form is going to be ready for squeeze. Um, so the first thing I think we need to do is the um, uh, VMs need to be declared um, multi-arc capable so that you can have uh, a particular, you can have VMs for your particular architecture. Um, I don't think any of the uh, architectural packages need to know about multi-arc but we should probably sort out the JVMs sooner rather than later. Uh, and yeah, I'm out of um, policy-related things that I wanted to talk about, but if people have uh, things that they would like to talk about, then you know, please do chime in at this point. Uh, well, just my question is, what's the motivation for the class file versions? I mean, shouldn't it be dictated by the minimum version of Java that is needed to actually compile the... Um, oh, there's two issues. There's the, the source and target version. So you can have things where you can build a source that requires Java 1.6, but it can build class, classes that will work with 1.5. If we don't mandate anything in policy, then people will get whatever the, tend to get whatever the default is without specifying. Um, and in a lot of cases, that will just be the, the most recent one that they built with. Um, if there was some suggestion it might be good for us to say, that would like, if you can, to use an older class file version because that'll make it more compatible with, you know, other VMs if people want to use them or whatever. Um. Well, just a comment. I mean, I, I mean, Sun is nothing supported anymore except for Java 1.6, right? Um, unless you pay for it. I don't work for Sun anymore. 
Um, uh, well, for, for, that wasn't a bar. <laughs> you were looking at me, though. For, for, for my day job, I happen to know that if a company has extended support, um, then 1.5 is still supported for them, but not publicly, um, because we mandate that we ship everything as Java 1.5 and compile with it to make sure that our clients can use an older VM. Yeah. Um, so I, I certainly understand that, but it's kind of ancillary yeah. to the Debian question. Yeah. And I almost wonder, it seems that the precedent in Debian is to, is to always be looking forward and moving forward. Yeah. And so. Uh, but I mean, this is at the moment it might not matter. But at the point we start getting one step and whatever, do we want to have a policy on this? Could that be expressed by the uh, the JRE depends if you said you know so, Java, se or Java yeah. seven runtime or something? So uh, there are a couple of issues with this. First of all, yes, um, and if you build with Java Helper and use the automatic dependency generation, it will look at all of the classes that you ship, work out what the highest class file version is, and use that to generate the automatic depends list. However, if one of, the, if, uh, one of your libraries, uh, if, if you are compiled as 1.5, and one of your libraries is compiled as 1.6, then it can't necessarily tell this. Um, and I think I try and do some recursive stuff over class passes there, but that's the sort of thing where it's more of an issue, because a Java library doesn't have a dependency on uh, JREs. So it can't express that it needs a particular version. So not on the Java policy per se, but uh, besides the policy, uh, do we have a, a packager, a Java packager guide, or do we want to start working on that? I mean, we, we, we definitely should have one. Uh, like I said, there's um, and my next talk will have the links to it, but on packagejava.alioth um, slash examples, which isn't actually linked anywhere but will be shortly, there are lists of example packages to say if you have you know, a library whose upstream build is ant, you want your Debian packaging to look a bit like this. Um, I think we want to add some more examples there. Sadly, I don't know anything about Maven, so uh, it's hard for me to write those, but if people want to contribute those, that would be great. Um, we do have some stuff on uh, the wiki and our Alioth pages which um, which try and give you some packaging guides. Uh, I think some of those, quite a lot of those are outdated and it's something we really should be working on to try and get them up to date. Um. The Debian policy normally is in sync with the guides, no? so <coughs> it would be nice to have both kind of in a similar document or very yeah. close by. So, uh, quick question. Um, the, there's been an open bug against Debian policy for some time, um, filed by someone who I don't think was actually directly involved in the Java policy discussion at all, asking whether the Java policy would, should be incorporated as a sub policy to the Debian policy. Um, I would, as a policy maintainer, I don't really care. Uh, if, I mean, if you guys are comfortable maintaining it as a separate in, in Java Common, that sort of seems fine to me. But I thought I would bring it up here and ask what people think they would like to do. What happens with other? Um, language specific policies because I know Perl and some others have these sorts of things. So currently the only language specific policy that, that's maintained as part of the policy package is the Perl policy although there's also a few other things like the DevConf policy that are, that, that's in there. Um, the, the, once it's in the policy package right now all the policy all the policies in the policy package are maintained via the same procedure uh, which means you know somebody for, somebody proposes language after some discussion uh, and it needs, uh, it needs three seconds where the person proposing the language is counted as one of those three uh, and then gets incorporated in the next release. Um, we can set up a different, uh, different procedure for our sub-policy if there's some reason to, though. So it, we don't necessarily need to follow that same procedure. Um, it, and it's more, I think it's just more a matter of, con of convenience of whoever's maintaining it. I don't have any trouble having it be out of three. The, the Emacs policy has been maintained with Emacs pol uh, packages for years and not part of the actual Debian policy package. But some people do seem to have a perception that if it's in the Debian policy package, it's somehow more official. Well, I think we're now at the point where it's not so outdated. It would be embarrassing to link it from Debian policy. So I think, um, I think at least have having Debian policy mention it, even if it's out of tree, would be a good thing. OK. Uh, I don't have a particularly big view on whether or not we should integrate it. I suppose. It's interesting to consider whether violations of sub-policies are RC by default and whether or not having it incorporated in Debian policy rather than out of tree affects that. 
Well, you know, violations of Debian policy are not RC by definition either. So, uh, in well, practice, ser serialist violations are serious, which is RC by default. That's yeah, the definition of serious. Kinda, yeah, I mean, it, uh, officially, the release managers set RC policy. And yeah. if they decide that something, even if it's a must in policy, is not RC, then they, they override that. But yeah, but it, um, I mean, I think that in practice, everybody everybody feels like the language the, the language policies, if they are believed to be stable and fairly complete. Uh, I mean, for example, I know the Python policy has gone through various iterations and is not necessarily in that, case, in that state right now. Um, that they should be treated like policy, whether they're in part of the policy package or not. Um, I mean, if, if the language experts in Debian say, don't do it this way, and someone does it that way, then I think that's an RC bug by default. Uh, so I don't think it really changes anything very much there. But it might change perception. Yeah. I, that's always kind of fuzzy. Uh, it might also change how easy it is for people to find it, which is yes. possibly a good thing as well. Yeah, it, one of the things, I mean, generally if it ends up in the policy package, the Debian web team, I mean, not that I've explicitly talked to them about this or anything, but generally it ends up on the, in, in that section on the Debian website as well, which helps people find it. I have uh, vaguely remember that in the new maintainers uh, quiz, there are some, Debian Java related questions. So mm -hmm. that uh, when you take an exam to become a Debian developer, they ask you stuff related to the, the Debian Java policy, which actually is no longer true. But uh, there was so. Uh, so I mean, I th I, 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 there may well be examples in there, but I think the language specific stuff is generally, if you have somebody who's working on this language, they should be able to answer questions about it. Uh, other people, not necessarily. Um, I mean, certainly the recent style of running NM is that you can look at all of their work and that should answer most of the questions without having to actually ask them. Um. It used to be the case, um, and I learned this because I was from this, um, used to be the case that NM did ask a few questions about language specific policies but this was more a way of trying to figure out whether people knew what they were and where to find them rather than to see whether they knew how they uh, how they w how they were set up um, and because it was often misunderstood we've actually they've actually changed that now um, so it's not the way it used to be anymore should we include anything about how to set up maybe in repositories on the policy um, I think it would be useful to mention Maven uh, more than we do, uh, specifically around if you have a Maven policy, uh, a Maven package, then you should be using the Debian um, Maven directory and, and, and these sorts of things. I actually have a note from when we mentioned it earlier that that's, I think we should include in there. Um, uh, we want to be careful to specify only the behavior it should have and not necessarily what tools you should be using to do that. I mean, that's something we should have guides for, but I don't think it should be in policy. And what about uh, trying to enforce a manifest with class paths? If when we come up with um, a solution for recursive class paths, whether that be in as the class path entries in manifests or anything else, that definitely should be specified in policy uh, and we should mandate this because uh, I don't think it's reasonable that we should expect everybody to know about all of the recursive dependency tree below them, uh, they only need to know about, they should only have to be, be just, just include in their class path the jars that they use, and if those jars require other jars, that should happen automatically. Um, and yeah, if, if uh, I don't know, it's, what's people's opinion? Should, should, we require, should we require this with people using class path manifest entries in libraries, or do you think there's a, anybody think there's a problem with that? Well, I mean, you know it when you build it, you know, well, well, you have execution, uh, requirements if you are getting things through reflection that may be you may just not know it so um, that's kind of a different issue because if you're doing that then you will uh, then, then, then the jar will uh, that will actually do the loading for you so you don't actually need it to be in a in a manifest entry it's only if you know you're expecting somebody to put it on the class path that you shouldn't be doing that so either the jar should I disagree. I mean, if it needs, if you are doing reflection to get the stuff, you still need it on the class path. Um, well, yeah. Okay. So there are situations where you do need it on a class path <coughs> like that. Um, I 
I think if you've got your own um, class loader, then you can do it all yourself, and you don't need it on the fast path. Uh, if people are doing things where they need to have something on the class path, but it's up to the, the program which is using the library as to what that is, then that is a reasonable thing for the library to have to know about, uh, for the, the program to have to know about. So that's not necessarily something that should be in there. In a sense, but that stuff ends up being a dependency of the of the library. So, so um, the maintainer has to have some idea that that stuff is required to run the library. Sure. Um, but I think it's actually in the same way that um, I think it's actually something that's also a dependency of the, of the program using the library because the library says you have to use me with one of these things. Um, you have to determine which of these this is and you set that by setting it in your class path. That is a reasonable thing to expose up. But where it's you need this jar, that sh should be handled by the jar in question. So if, if all the... Um if all the jars are living in user shared Java, then it's I, my my assumption is that most JVMs will can use the manifest in the jar out of the box, and that will work. But yeah. where this breaks down is if people have private jars, right? Uh, you can put full paths in. Um, I believe you can put explicit um, full paths in manifest entries as well as relative paths. You can. Okay. So then, okay. So the, the, of course, where I'm going with that is that I, I would hate to have a wrapper have to do the inspection, uh, the recursive inspection of class path and construct a, a correct class path before launching, because that uh, would be really slow. Well, that's the JVM will recursively enumerate class paths for you. If you have a jar which you put in your class path, um, and then somebody puts you in their class path, the JVM will load both you and the things that are in your class path. Oh, I, right, and I'd much rather that that happens in the JVM yeah. rather than in like a shell script. Yeah. Well, at the moment that happens in the shell script, and you have to do it manually. Uh, putting it in the class path entry in the manifest. Uh, I mean, the big issue here is that nobody actually puts a class path entry in their manifest file as upstream. Um, if you come back today to talk after lunch, then um, I will talk about packaging helpers, which help you fix up these sorts of things. Um, you know, we can write tools to do this for you. If no one else has a question, I. Here's just a, a naive question. I, uh, can somebody explain to me, you know, kind of the, the level of multi-arch support that is targeted for Squeeze? How, how, much, how far are we going with multi-arch? Uh, is there anybody in the audience who happens to know this better than I do? Um, I'm not sure the exact status. I talked to Steve a little bit about it uh, yesterday. Um, he, he said that he thinks it's pretty much ready um, to go into Squeeze. Um, would there some standardization required for, uh, to figure out exactly what to call the paths? Um, but that, like the whole, the, the whole, the overall design is pretty much done. And I believe the dpackage support is pretty much done, and the libc support for finding the stuff is, is basically done. And so I think there's general agreement on where to install the stuff. And the only hard parts are things like um, hard versus soft float on ARM, how you name the directories appropriately so that you don't end up colliding. Uh, so I, you know, I think that most of the work there has been done on on, on C libraries and and the. Anything for any of the, anything for any of the other languages is, is harder. Uh, I believe that the intention was to defer figuring out what to do about Perl modules, for example, until the next release yeah. after Squeeze. Um, so Java may be in a similar situation yeah. there. Uh, yeah, I think the idea was that the D package and C library, all of the, the support stuff, is in for Squeeze, and a small number of the most relevant C libraries will be set up to work with multi arch, but. Um, everything else is, is being punted out to a future release. And I'm sure that one of the goals would be to get rid of the AMD64 giant collection of yeah. random I386 package libraries yeah. package. Yeah. I, think, I think that's what they're mainly aim, aiming to sort out. Um. So are there any other questions or shall we all go to lunch a bit early? Cool, I think we're done. <laughs>